Australia has a mega reputation as a sporting nation. Globally, we punch above our weight on the field, in the pool and on court. How does that global success play out locally? Over the past two years, major sporting events were disrupted by COVID-19. Crowd numbers were decimated, jeopardising sponsorships and broadcast deals. The wide-scale emergence of multiple streaming services has also created a highly competitive environment for broadcast rights and competition to capture audiences' attention. Sport, like every other business in Australia, has had to continuously adapt and pivot to survive and thrive. Welcome to The Business of Sport, the latest Business of Leadership podcast, brought to you by the Australian Graduate School of Management at the UNSW Business School. In this episode, we investigate the opportunities and challenges for sports to succeed on and off the field in Australia, where professional teams face a battle for the hearts and minds of fans. Danny Townsend, the CEO of Sydney FC, speaks to Professor Nick Wales about new business models and the future of football in Australia. How is a data-driven approach to sports marketing and operations impacting how clubs operate? And how will interest in elite women's football create new market opportunities for the code? We also hear from Dr. Felix Tan, Associate Professor of Information Systems and the Director of UNOVA Research Labs at the UNSW Business School. He explains how sports organisations from around the world are using data analytics to enhance both the fan experience and the performance of the athletes. First up, Professor Nick Wales and Danny Townsend. Hi, my name is Nick Wales. I'm the director of AGSM and welcome to the latest episode of the AGSM Business of Leadership podcast. And I'm delighted to welcome Danny Townsend, who's the CEO of Sydney FC. So Danny, great to have you here. Thanks for having me on, Nick. Danny, we're going to talk about the football club and the business model, but I'm really interested to know what does the career of a CEO of a football club look like? Talk us through your career and how you ended up in this position. I think it's been a bit of a windy road, really. I started off as a professional footballer myself and and had my average career cut short pretty early, probably for good reason, due to injury, which I think was a bit of a blessing in disguise, really, because it was early enough in my career to ensure I focused on my studies, which was a lot of my teammates weren't focused on education, they were focused on football. And knowing that I was having a fairly a short runway for my career, I was focused on ensuring that I was looking after myself after football and I happened to do a postgrad at Uni New South Wales as well. You know, I was obviously a person who was predisposed to sport, really didn't see myself working in any other industry and was lucky enough to land a role in the Australian Jockey Club at the time in a, in a commercial role. And then not long after that, set up a sports consulting agency that led me to a 14-year career overseas living in Singapore, London and New York and had some success there fortunately and we sold that agency back in 2016 and having had a couple of kids along the way and an Australian wife, there was a a real keenness to bring the family home and when we were able to do that, the opportunity to get back into football in Australia presented itself with Sydney FC and yeah, the the rest is history I suppose. I think it might be quite useful for our listeners to just understand the economics of a football club. So, you know, where does the revenue come from? Where are your major expenses? How does that play out over the course of a year? Yeah, it's an interesting one. You don't get asked that a lot as a CEO of a football club because most of your stakeholders really are focused on outcomes and the outcomes that are visible to the majority of those stakeholders as trophies. But at the end of the day, you can only really put yourself in a position to win trophies if you've got a sound business that underpins that. And I often say at the end of any given season, I don't get to do a lap of honour with the balance sheet. It's the captain with the trophies that people care about. But ultimately, our business at Sydney FC was one that for many years didn't make any money. It relied on on the ownership group to continually pour money in to keep it going. And I think it was a bit of a foreign concept to me to actually have a business that was losing money but considered successful. So that was something I felt my role as a CEO was about, yes, facilitating 
the ongoing success on the field, but ensuring off the field we could be a sound business. And that really starts with driving revenues. The key revenues for a football club are obviously the media grant that they receive from the centre of the league, its sponsorship revenues, membership is critical, you know, match day ticket sales, uh, our merchandise, our community and grassroots work is also a critical part of the business. But largely they're the revenue streams that the club relies on to fund the investment we make in football. So it's a skinny business it often appears on the outside as probably a bigger business than it really is but yeah you know having run traditional businesses and, and now run a sporting club you know they're very similar your people are critical our people are critical whether they're kicking the ball whether they're supporting those kicking the ball or whether they're running the commercial side of the club successful clubs rely on great people and all businesses i think have that same philosophy so Danny, just give me a sense how many employees or how many people are we talking about yeah, if you break it out, typically how the business operates is the football side of the business and the administration side of the business. The administration side of the business is about 40 people. And then in the football side, if you count the playing group, you know, all of the high performance men, women, you're upwards of around 100. And then we have a really wide group of casual staff that will either be working on match day, um, running our community programs, coaching in our coaching clinics. We've got upwards of 200 casual staff that we pay any given month. So all in all, we're paying out about 350 odd people each month and they're varying degrees of full-time to part-time status. So you come back to Australia, come into you know what's been an incredibly successful club on the fields, but having to ensure that the business running effectively and then doesn't take very long and then COVID hits. So give me a sense about what that experience was like and what was the approach that you took to that? Yeah, I think the first thing I would say is it was scary you know, scary for everyone when COVID first hit, we never really quite knew what it was and how long it would be here for and what magnitude of disruption it would provide. And I think I'm one that really looks at corporate values as being important. And I think they're often overplayed and people will talk about culture and values and they'll post them all over their boardroom walls, but they really get tested when times are tough. And one thing that yeah, we pride ourselves on at this club, apart from winning things, is we're a family. And like good families, when times are tough, they stick together. And this is going to test whether or not we stick together as a group and come out the other side of whatever is in front of us. And we don't know what it is and how long it's going to be here for. But my goal was to come out the other side with the same people that we went into it with. And that philosophy stood us in good stead because you know the ownership supported that philosophy our staff collectively took pain together. Everyone took pay cuts. Everyone, including players, everyone was committed to working together to come out the other side. And we came out that first COVID period without losing a staff member. And we finished that season and, and won the championship, which was an enormous, I suppose, relief that we'd sort of been through that. But then we were rewarded for it with the ultimate trophy, which was the championship. And then we started another season thinking it was all behind us. Lo and behold, it reared its head again and caused us some angst. But you know, I think this season that we're in currently has probably been the biggest challenge. Having had two seasons of COVID interruption, really going into this one, we didn't expect any more interruption. COVID was sort of behind us. And then Omicron came from nowhere just after the start of our season and really hit us during our peak period, which is January, which is school holidays. Traditionally, our period where we get a lot of attention, our fans, which are largely young families, are on holiday and they're attending in big numbers and they couldn't attend. And that really, really hurt everyone, both economically, but just in terms of momentum. It just took the wind out of everyone's sails and but again, we've survived. We're in good shape. The club's you know, values, as I said, have really stood us in good stead. And, and here we are. There's two things that really occur to me that firstly, you've got to have a lot of resilience in that environment, right? And everyone has to be able to deal with multiple setbacks. And then the second thing is you've got to have this incredible agility to be able to respond to what's going on, often on a week by week basis or a day by day basis. Do you think it's leaving your organisation stronger for the future? resilience and the ability to to move quickly is something we really learned over these last couple of years. We as a league across our men and women's competitions have rescheduled 88 fixtures. When you talk about rescheduling a fixture, 
someone on the outside might think, oh, you just pick it up and you move the date and the time and you kick off at a different time. But with that comes having to book a new stadium, having to book all the staff of the stadium. You've got to move the production company, the cameras, the, the crew, the rigging. It's an enormous thing to move one game. And when I look back five years ago when I first came in, if someone had asked us to move a game, we'd have gone, you're kidding me. We can't move a game. We've got 13 home games and we know where they are for the next nine months and we play them on the days that we're told. Now we're moving games with three days' notice and it does mean that some of the preciousness and some of the things you took for granted pre-COVID, now uh, you look back at that and go, wow, we were pretty high maintenance. And the players and the coaching staff who said, I can't, I'm preparing for a game in two weeks' time. You can't ask me to move it a day. Now we're saying to Steve Corica, the head coach last week, he was going to Melbourne on Saturday and on Thursday we said, no, no, you're not, you're going to Perth. And they picked up that day, went to the airport, got in a plane, went to Perth, played and won. That would have been unheard of two years ago. So it does teach you resilience. I think it brings your group closer together. And I think those things now are set. You know, the toothpaste out of the tube, you can't push it back in. That behaviour is now set in people's ways. And I think that's one of the good things that will come out of this. What does your sort of community engagement look like? Because it seems that football's deliberately tried to make itself part of the community that's a key part of its strategy, but what does that look like and how do you run and organise that? Yeah, uh, it's a really good point and it's one that when I came back to Australia, I looked at what are the strengths, like any business, you look at what are your strengths, what are the things that you can bank on that your competitors can't and participation was ours. There's more people turn up, pay up week in, week out to play football in this country than the sum of rugby league, rugby union, AFL combined. Right, So why isn't our professional game in a similar sort of level of dominance? It's because we didn't have that connection. Over the years, the game, our professional league, 16 years old, you know, it's arguably almost a generation old. We're competing against leagues like the AFL and NRL, which are over 100 years old, five generations old. So we can't rely on that. My grandfather was a supporter of X and my father was a supporter of X and so I'm a supporter of X. We don't have that. So we've got to work hard now at not converting, you know, a 40 to 50-year-old mum or dad. I want to convert the 5, 10, 15-year-old young Australian footballer who wants to drag their mum and dad to a football game. And that starts a community. So I looked at Sydney FC's community program and it was pretty negligible. We have seven local associations in our catchment area and one of the first things I did was reached out to their CEOs and introduced myself and said, I want to come and see you. And the response I got from each of them was, why? What do you mean why? I said, because you own my customers. I want to connect with your people because they should be our customers and our fans. And I went round to Sydney and we talked football and we talked about the opportunity and the one thing they were all challenged with was resource. They had resource issues because they're typically not for profit what I have as a commercial organization is resource and said, well, like you run all these community programs. I've got resource to run them. Why don't we build joint venture businesses together where we'll come in, we'll commercialize them, we'll do all the hard work and we'll share the money. And they were like, where do I sign? And that was really the genesis of it. And we've now, what, five years on, we've got seven joint venture businesses with associations at grassroots covering 255 clubs that is the single biggest driver of growth in our membership. It's no surprise why. Yeah, it's a great story and really interesting. So, Danny, you recently took on the role as the CEO of Australia Premier League, as well as your day job. And I'd like to explore this direct-to-consumer relationship you want to create and, and the role of digital in that. What will that look like and what are you hoping that that creates? Yeah, look, um, I've been sort of in that role in a hybrid capacity for about 18 months. So, as we unbundled from the FA, we had to stand up a business Very quickly, a startup operation, we had no staff, so a bunch of us in different clubs lent our time to the cause. But key to our strategy at APL was all about building a direct-to-consumer relationship with football fans in this country. We set about building a broadcast relationship with Channel 10 and Paramount Plus, which is the, the streaming service, but at the same time, building digital infrastructure and data infrastructure that would prepare us for the future. And our view is if we can better understand our fans and our customers and our participants, and we serve them a digital solution that delivers them genuine utility, they'll use it every day, they'll engage more often, they're much more likely to connect to our professional leagues. And with that comes the more traditional revenues of 
becoming members, buying merchandise, turning up to games and supporting our club. So it was very much what we call a conversion strategy is converting what we see as survey data records that say there's millions of people that love our game and converting them into one-to-one data records. We get to know them. We get to understand what they want out of their football experience and then personalize that experience to ensure they keep coming back and they're engaged. So that potentially leads to a rich stream of data and you having sort of access to, you know, quite fine-grained analytics. What sort of change will you need in your organisation and the rest of the league to be able to effectively respond to that and effectively, you know, use that data? Yeah, I say to our team and our people in culture department who've been building the team with me for the last sort of 14 months is that we've got to think ourselves as a, a digital entertainment company with a tech back end because that sport Football is what we do on the pitch, but the way we think about our business is that that we are a a digital entertainment business. And because that's the way our our consumers consume things these days, they do it all on web or app. And, you know, particularly when you look at the strengths of our game, you know, we are the number one sport in the country for under 35s. They're digital native. They're not reading newspapers. They're not watching free-to-air television necessarily, but they're all on their mobiles a lot. They're all on their tablets. They're on their computers. So having a digital-first proposition is going to build the foundation for our future relationships with our customers. But it also suggests you're going to need different people in the organisations, right? Because that understanding of customers and consumers and the ability to respond to analytics is going to play a much bigger role. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when you look at the way people consume sport these days as well and the time they take to consume it, you know, 90 minutes of football, if you think about what a league and a club would traditionally do, it would say, I'm going to sell all my media rights and I'm just going to focus on playing football. That's not enough anymore. You know, the football is one thing, that's your core product, but it is what you deliver your fans around the 90 minutes that really engages them. It's the short form content, it's the behind the scenes. We've stood up a full production capability. We've got digital producers, you know, we've got editorial, like we've had to become a media company overnight because that's what our fans want. The time it takes to sit down and watch 90 minutes of football, particularly for a 12 year old, it's, it's really hard, but they'll consume football in many, many different ways, largely on their phone. So yeah, that was our clear strategy and and I think it's the right strategy. But how do you monetize that? You can monetize the 90 minutes by selling a cable package or entry into a gate, but some of the other stuff's quite hard to monetize, right? Yeah, I think you go back to commercial connection and what sponsorship traditionally was, was whack my logo on the shirt or around the pitch and have the people sitting on the couch see my brand and potentially connect with it. We're moving out of the real estate business and into the customer acquisition business for our sponsors. So if we build a rich cohort of consumers who might be in a certain demographic who are in the market to buy health insurance, then I can segment those out and deliver those customers to my health insurance sponsor And have them pay a premium for that because the cost of acquisition for a health insurance company is really high. If I can deliver those customers direct to them digitally because I know who they are, I know what their preferences are, and I know they're in the market to buy health insurance, that's a far more valuable proposition than a logo on a shirt. So as the consumption of sport changes and the way in which brands orientate with that changing environment becomes opportunity. And and that's where the, the revenues reliance on media companies and traditional sponsorship is changing. So I want to turn attention now to what to me looks like one of the most exciting developments in sport, which is the growth of the women's game in football in particular, but growing in lots of different leagues. Can you talk to me about how Sydney FC approached that and how that's going and and what the future of the women's game looks like? Yeah, look, it's come a long way in a short space of time, I'll say. How do I better put it? From a commitment perspective, I think it's been there, the A-League women or the W-League, as it was previously known, has been around for about 12 seasons now, one of the longest running elite female sport competitions in the country. But again, when I came in, it was treated very differently to the male part of the club, which I was intrigued by, particularly as a father of two girls that played football and and there was just so much that wasn't right in terms of where attention was provided and it was almost like you've got all these fans and and members that love the men's team but don't care about the women's team and I'd ask people like are you a Sydney FC fan or are you a Sydney FC men's team fan you go no I'm a Sydney FC fan well why don't you go to watch the women's team so there was this real disconnect between how the two genders were treated And I think we've made a huge amount of ground, but we've got a long, long way to go. And I think our sport is one of the few that is genuinely gender agnostic. Females and males can play at the same level and the grassroots growth of the female game is enormous. 
So it'd be crazy for a sport like ours not to take advantage of that and deliver a product that you know, is commensurate with the amount of people playing the game. I think where we are challenged and all female sports is challenged in is the commercial side of things. And that's improving. You know, we had a Women's World Cup coming in 23 and that's opened up a bit of interest in it. But the metrics that you typically judge commercial outcomes on are a long, long way off. You know, things like attendance, audiences, they're just not there. And, you know, I put it down to just behaviour. And I think as that continues to change, the commercial metrics around female sports will change, particularly football, and you'll continue to see investment. But our perspective as a league and as a club is you've got to invest in it now to get the benefit longer term. And we're fortunate that the male game drives a lot of commercial outcomes that we reinvest in the female game to enable it to get to a point where it can generate its own commercial outcomes. Okay, so you see it as an investment prospect. I wondered, you know, you talked a little bit there about attendance at games being a big revenue driver. I'm wondering if you're seeing a difference in sponsors' attitudes to the women's game. So are there new types of sponsors? Is there an interest in sponsoring that activity that you haven't seen before? There definitely is. I think Women's World Cup coming to Australia and New Zealand has helped. I think the success of the Matildas particularly has, has helped. But it's interesting when you stare into the belly of, you know, a corporate opportunity that started with the female game and the interest in that is genuine. But when they look at the metrics, it's like, oh, I'm not sure I can really justify spending that sort of money. So can I also have some assets on the male side of the game to bolster the metrics to justify the investment, which is fine, you know, because that's part of that maturation process commercially that we're fortunate that we can use both genders to drive, you know, a collective outcome that one day I'm sure will be more balanced, let's say. Danny, I wanted to talk, you know, lots of industries characterized by disruption and, you know, the one that I think affects you the most is the disruption in the media and the traditional broadcast model, uh, those type of things. Can you talk to me about that change and how that's impacting you and the way that you're thinking about the future of that? Yeah, it's definitely a global, I suppose, trend. You know, as consumption of media has evolved over the years, you know, largely professional sports of all kinds have really survived on the back of you know, media rights fees that have been paid by largely originally terrestrial broadcasters and then there was the emergence of cable and satellite TV yeah, and those models are very high margin models, which enables those type of companies to spend significant amounts of money on rights. As consumption has shifted to a digital first proposition and streaming has become a more prominent player in, in the distribution of rights, just that the business model doesn't sustain the margins that those traditional broadcast models did, which means it's not affecting the, the major tier one sports like the Premier League or the NBA or the NFL, or those type of things. But all the others are being compromised because the traditional broadcast models are not as profitable as they used to be. The substitution in streaming is much lower margin. Therefore, their willingness to spend rights is diminished. However, that opens up a much bigger opportunity for sports to build direct consumer relationships with its customers. And that's where our focus is around football. We have that 8 million people that identify with football in this country. And we only know that through survey data. So what we're about is building the most sophisticated data and digital infrastructure around a code that will enable us to have a one-to-one -one data relationship with every fan of football in this country and then serve them an experience that is tailored to their own personal preferences. And if we can do that, and when we do that, because we're in the process of doing that, we'll have a far richer relationship with our fans that will ultimately bear more commercial outcomes down the track. Does that mean you're potentially disintermediating the broadcasters? Is Sydney FC going to, for example, start broadcasting its own games and packaging its own content? Or is the relationship slightly different? It's a league-driven outcome. So you're not going to be doing that on a club-by-club -club basis. But at the APL, if I put my APL hat on, you know, that's absolutely our strategy. And it's not to disaffiliate with traditional media. Like I think there's always a role to play for all those. We've got a fantastic relationship with Channel 10 and Viacom CBS, Paramount Plus. But if you just look at the way the media is structured in Australia, you've got you know Fairfax and Nine, you've got News Corp, Foxtel, you've got Seven, you've got Ten. Everyone sort of backs their horses and then sort of really promotes their horses hard but sort of forgets about the others. And the adjacency that we had in sport historically is being diminished so you have really got to own your own relationship with your customer and fortunately with the you know the evolution and sophistication of 
digital and data infrastructure these days, sports can do that. Sports can hold the keys to their future, where in the past, the sports were heavily reliant on others to fund those relationships with their customers. Okay. You know, you're sort of having to really think about new business models and new ways of doing things. You know, I've heard you talk about it being a global game. To what extent are you looking at what's happening with a China club or a Spanish-based club and drawing you know, their business lessons there? Or, you know, where do you look for inspiration about running the business and its next stage of development? Yeah, I think I was fortunate in my previous stage of my career where I was consulting to some of the biggest football clubs, baseball clubs, basketball franchises, Formula One team. So I saw a lot of best practice, but it's all got to be looked at through the lens of the domestic market that we're in. And one thing that I know and why so many Australians are successful in global sports marketing is that we are a highly competitive marketplace for sport. And if you are not doing and delivering best practice, it's really hard. You know, I look at having lived in New York, you know, there are more professional sports teams in Sydney than there are in the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. You know, and you think about the population size there, it's tenfold of what's in Sydney. So we are in a very competitive sports marketing landscape, you know, and we've got to think differently. And I think some of the best innovations come out of this market for that reason. But you've also got to look abroad. You've got to constantly change. The market is moving. You think about things like Web3 and tokenization and all this, that this wave of crypto that's washing over the broader economy, but that's also really prevalent in sports and how we navigate our way through that. There's always new things around the corner and and getting ahead of that and executing appropriately is really important. Danny, you talked about your career and injuries along your career, and I'm interested in how you as a CEO think about player management and player well-being and you know what's changed in the time that since you played I think when you look at the change in sophistication around high performance back to when I was playing there was very little load management there was very little analytics there certainly wasn't the GPS data and and all the other well-being data that we get today and there's probably no surprise that the injuries that were happening back in those days are far greater than they are today you know we invest a huge amount of money at Sydney FC on the well-being of our players from under 12s all the way through to our first teams for men and women because if they're healthy off the field, their ability to perform on the field is better and and that's really key to the strategy. Danny, how do you deal with the trade-off between the short-term pressures to succeed on the paddock and then the long-term career goals of players or the long-term aspirations? Surely that you have to balance those two things. Definitely. And look, I'm a real advocate for educating players and work closely with the PFA from when I was playing as a PFA delegate now to my role. It's really hard to get into a 19-year-old professional athlete that they should think about life after football because by nature of being a professional athlete, you're usually so focused and partly been in a sycophantic environment where your parents, your friends, your relatives since the age of six have told you what a wonderful footballer you are and therefore you're never going to be anything else other than a professional footballer and then you become one and then you're like, well, of course, I was always going to be one and I don't need to think about what happens in 12 years' time when I'm 32 and no longer able to play. And I saw a lot of teammates of mine who didn't have the opportunity I had to get an education while I was playing who finished their much better careers than I had and finished and effectively were uneducated, had no work experience at all and are laying roof tiles. And it's not that they're incapable of doing anything, but they just never took the time to do it because they didn't think they needed it. And there's only so many coaching jobs, only so many jobs in the media. And once you exhaust those, you're back into the workforce with very little to lean on. And I spend a lot of time with our team and actually with Union New South Wales and the work we do with the uni around really encouraging our players in our academies before they even become professional to focus on their schooling, get through the high school certificate, educate themselves, where possible go to university whilst they're playing. Players have a lot of downtime. You know, they train for four or five hours a day and they've got another four or five hours where they're sitting around just playing video games or doing things that the 19-year-olds or 20-year-olds do. You know, I really impress upon them. Go to university, get a degree. If it takes you six, seven years, just do it because there'll be a time inevitably in your career where you're going to need it. And I think that's starting to change. It is hard sometimes, as I said, because yeah, young, confident players don't often want to think about what life after football means, but inevitably they end up there and we've got to prepare them best for it. Danny, it's been a fascinating conversation. I hope you go great on the field, but fantastic to learn a little bit more about the organisation and running the business. So thanks for joining me. No, thanks for having me on, Nick. Appreciate it.
According to Danny, relationships between sporting clubs and their customers are changing at a rapid pace. With new digital technology and access to data, sports clubs are in a unique position to connect and grow alongside their fans. So what does the future hold? And what impact can these data-driven decisions have on the economic value of the sporting industry? From unique user journeys to using AI in gymnastics judging, there's plenty of possibilities. Let's hear from Dr. Felix Tan. I'm Felix Tan, and I'm an Associate Professor of Information Systems and the Director of UNSW UNOVA Research Labs at UNSW Business School. My research interests are in digital transformation for good, digital platforms, e-commerce, sports analytics, and enterprise systems. So at UNSW UNOVA Research Labs, I lead multidisciplinary research teams, and we collaborate with businesses to co-create solutions, capability, practices to support their digital transformation journey. So for example, over the last few years, we have been working with SAP, a software partner, studying the role of data analytics in enabling organizations in the sporting industry. The case studies that we've written about is of Bayern Munich Football Club, Red Bull Munich Ice Hockey Team, RNL Handball Team in Mannheim, Gymnastics Federation in Europe. And we study how these sporting organizations achieve business performance and sporting excellence through data analytics. Overseas professional bodies are already using data analytics to enhance the sporting experience for fans and also for sporting performance of athletes, particularly in spectator sports like the NBA, NFL, National Baseball League in America, professional football in Europe. So from our research, we uncovered rare insights to the applications of data analytics to player and team performance during and after game day event management on game day, and customer fan engagement. We reviewed through our research how data analytics enable these organizations to achieve transformation of its business ecosystem. We also uncover new practices and formative strategies that drive industry and culture change in the industry and build a network of co-specialization amongst its stakeholders. Because generally, technology and digital innovation and the use of data have the means to improve how fans engage with the sport and also how athletes playing the sport can engage with fans. One of the projects that we did with SAP was to seek a better understanding of how professional sporting organizations like Bayern Munich Football Club use data and analytical solutions to achieve leadership not just from a sporting performance perspective, but also from a business perspective as a highly successful running organization. So what we did was put together a case study of Bayern Munich's digital 4.0 transformation journey. And what we learned was some of the very interesting things that they did with data analytics, particularly around game day performance by the athletes, event day management, and around fan engagement. So the research revealed insights on how data can be used to benefit businesses and their customers and their journeys. So data analytics gives management of sporting organizations the power and the opportunity to identify new opportunities and find new solutions to known problems. In football, data-driven decisions can have huge economic and social impact on the organizations across recruitment of talent, performance, event day management, and marketing. So for example, user journeys of fans are very different. So from our research with Bayern Munich, we revealed that no two fans are the same. And in the case of Bayern Munich, 81 user personas were found to be associated with the club. So 81 different user journeys and potential use of data. So for example, a 20-year-old fan from Shanghai and how he engages with the club would be very different from an 80-year-old fan in Bavaria will be very different. So the opportunities for sports analytics and data analytics to create opportunities to create and target product service systems of the different personas you can imagine is huge. So we've heard about how data can improve the user experience for fans. Now let's hear more from Felix about the role analytics can play in the evaluation of sporting success. The 
the impact and the value of sports analytics for the business of sports in Australia and ASEAN is huge. Australia is a big sporting nation. And like many countries in Asia, PAC has a huge fan base for professional clubs in America and Europe, especially in spectator sports such as football, rugby league, rugby union, AFL. Football, for example, has a huge fan base across the Asia PAC, including Australia, where countries often invite top teams from the top leagues in Europe to Australia and the Asia PAC. And these events are usually very well received. So we can see that the appetite for sports data is high. And hence, analytics demand would also be very high. A case in point in football and the value that it brings, it is a multi-billion dollar industry. And refereeing and officiating or judging in the sport of football is a vital aspect of the sport and has huge ramifications for the business, but is also prone to errors arising from the inherent limitations to human cognitive functions and usually the speed of sports. So technology has the potential to assist in decision making, but also to change policy as we have seen in video-assisted refereeing technology, where the technology can help officials better enforce the laws of the game in the spirit that the game should be played and delivering the appropriate sanctions and disciplinary actions to the offending players. So the application of the technology can also be used in other sports. In another work with colleagues in Belgium and Japan, we studied the tensions and paradoxes that are related to artificial intelligence powered evaluation of artistic gymnastics. Given the complexity of scoring and the speed of athletics performance, Technology can help alleviate some of the problems of judging. And sports analytics has a very big role to play in delivering value for that sport. Thank you for joining us for the Business of Sport. To find out more about the AGSM Business of Leadership podcast series, search for AGSM's The Business of Podcast online or find us on your favourite podcast platform. Please share, rate and review and subscribe to AGSM's Business Podcast and look out for future episodes. In the meantime, you can follow AGSM at UNSW Business School on LinkedIn and Facebook for more industry insights for an accelerating world or find us at agsm.edu.au. Until next time, thank you for listening.